He went in the closet and he got a chainsaw. A chainsaw? And he started walking towards me. All of a sudden I couldn't move. I couldn't talk, but I could move my eyes. We can both go to jail. I don't give a f Cause I'm gonna beat your ass in the back of that police car and I'm gonna get you beat up in jail. Ed Buck was a wealthy political activist and Democratic donor who has donated more than $500,000 to political candidates such as Hillary Clinton. Ed Buck once had power and influence, but he turned into a depraved predator, targeting young, poor, black gay men, and injecting them with meth to the point of death. So it would have been you had you gone over there. If I had went over there that night, I would have let him inject me. Then you get asked to speak in court about your experiences. When this happened, keep in mind, the police did not do anything. He was telling them it was a drug overdose, and the police were listening to him. This is so cute. Hi, how are you? Good. Do you mind me on camera? Or? Uh, yes, I do. You don't want me on camera? Okay, okay. Let me, I'll keep it on the side. I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. Okay, I'm gonna turn the camera now. Oh my gosh, your place is so eclectic. You have so much personality. Uh, can I pet it? Yeah, you can pet it. Oh my gosh. I stole him from the back of a um, Chinese restaurant. What do you mean? I was a little, <laughs> not in my right mind, early one morning in, um, in San Francisco and Chinatown. And uh, there was these chickens going to the back of the store. And uh, I heard something in the box. And I looked and I saw him and I was like, oh, they're going to eat him. You know, so I grabbed him and ran. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Mm, no problem. So we're in Los Angeles in Koreatown right now. Yeah. How long have you lived in this apartment for? Um, almost two years. Congratulations, your own place. That's amazing. Oh, uh, it's okay. <laughs> Why just okay? Um, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, I've always had my own place. I have a strong work ethic. You work every day? 24-7. <laughs> the phone's always on. Always. <laughs> If you are one of those that have been wanting longer episodes and a way to support me and the channel, I started a Patreon. Thank you so much for your support. Do you get primarily your clients mostly on RentMed or where do you find your clients? Honestly, like I must exude like a, a prostitute niche or something like that, you know what I mean? Because I mean, just everywhere, you know? Would you consider yourself a prostitute or an escort? No, an escort, but you know, just somebody who gets money. I do think a prostitute's kind of an, an offensive term, isn't it? I mean, it can be. I mean, I view it like a prostitute walks the streets, which I've, I've, I've done that before, you know what I mean? But we're in an age now where if you work the streets, you're a junkie, like you're strictly out there you're trying to get drugs how long have you been in this game for oh about 14 ish but 15. 14 years old mm -hmm. my father was he was a drug addict and he um would pick me up and be like oh um you know such and such got a um, hotel room uh, with an indoor swimming pool, so um, you could go swimming. I'm like, huh? And he would drop me off, and I would go to the um, hotel, and um, yeah, things would happen. And then in the morning, he would, um, I would wake up, and there would be money in my shoe. And um, yeah, that's how I learned how to do it. Wow. At 14? Maybe 13. What were your thoughts at that age? At least I was getting money. Were you getting the money or was your dad getting the money? No, I was getting money. He was getting drugs. And did the guys that you're meeting with know that you were 13 years old? Of course. I've had dealings with like um, pedophiles like my whole up until this day. You know what I mean? Like they're out there, you know, it is what it is, you know. I was in uh, at home one night and my dad left me with him. And I told my dad, this is the first time I'm telling him, I was like, don't, I, I really don't want you to leave me with him. Like, I'm not comfortable. And when I saw that he was going to leave me anyways, okay, so now I, I realized what was going on. I went in there, at my dad and my stepmom's bathroom to take a bath in their garden tub. I had my ferret, because I had a, a ferret, and um, it was in there with me, and all of a sudden, I, the door was trying to open. And he was trying, I had the door locked, and he was trying to come in there with me while I was in the bathtub. So I put on my uh, pajamas, and I grabbed my backpack and my ferret, and I jumped out the window, and I walked all night up a railroad track, mind you, with no shoes on. There was alligators on both sides. Like, it was through the swamp, you know? So I walked in the middle of the railroad tracks. I couldn't see shit, but I just kept going, you know what I mean? And um, eventually, I, it came, I guess it was like five or six in the morning, I walked up the highway, and um, I was on Highway 95, walking down 
the highway and um a family pulled over they were um <laughs> they were in a station wagon they were so i get real upset when i talk about this because they were so nice mm -hmm. you know what i mean but they refused to let me keep walking on the highway and they didn't even have much you know what i mean there was like a hole in the back seat of the on the floorboard where you could see like the road going you know and they were so happy you know what i mean but the deal was they would give me a ride into town and they gave me some bus money and I got on the bus and I went to my mom's. My mom was worked at the hospital and I went in there. How did you tell your mom? Well, unfortunately, my mom was more like my sister. So my grandmother came and picked me up and my grandmother, I didn't even have to tell her she knew. You consider your grandma more of like your mother figure? Yeah. She had been asking me about it already, you know what I mean? Because of the gifts and the money and stuff like that. And she would always tell me like, Cody, that's going to age you. That's going to age you so fast. And, you know. But didn't she know that it wasn't your choice and it was your dad she doing didn't that? No, she wasn't. You know, she she knew what was up. You know, she. Um, so anyways, I told her what was going on. And that's whenever my life probably changed in a sense where I felt like I knew I was like always going to have to depend on me. You know what I mean? Because my mom and dad's answer was to sweep it under the carpet because they didn't want to go to court. And they said they didn't want me to get embarrassed myself or like, you know, go through that mentally. But it was really about them because in the end, they both were getting something out of it. Do you resent your dad for that? No. Nobody's perfect. I still talk to him to this day, you know, and um, I don't blame anybody. I don't, I don't hold um, anger because it's not good. He's my dad. I wouldn't be here if I wasn't for him, so. Have you had the conversation with him about like how? Yeah, I did a couple years ago. He how... apologized. He told me, he said he didn't know that, you know, that that was necessarily going on. And he, you know, he said he was, he should have paid more attention and you know maybe he didn't maybe i don't know but i know he knew come on now i don't know many men who would be okay with their son going to stay with a gay man in a hotel overnight or and he would wake up sometime because the man lived with us at one point and he would wake up and come get me out of his bed in the morning your dad would oh, yeah and the man would be holding me and everything so yeah he knew he's not stupid do your parents know that you're still in this game of course what can they say? Do they feel at all guilty for this? You know what? I don't ever try to make them feel guilty. I mean, in a lot of ways, I look at it like if my, if this hadn't happened to me when I was younger, what would I be doing now? You have to take the good with the bad. I think you're a beautiful person for thinking that. I really do. I think you're a strong, mature person for being able to put that to rest and behind you. Yeah. But, you know, if you have kids... Oh, I mean, I, that's probably why I won't have kids. Like, I would be that parent that, like, ruined their fucking lives. Like, I mean, I would never let them out of my sight, and I would probably kill somebody if they, like, <laughs> were doing anything, like, creepyish. Like, because in my mind, I know what can happen. It only takes three minutes. And someone's whole life changes. Oh, yeah. Imagine all these years I've been working, like, I've had close calls, you know. Of course, they pull guns on me. And then you can't even call the police because the police get there. They're going to take that person's side because they just look at me like, what the fuck? What were you doing in here? You know, they don't, they, that's the thing. They, you learn not to even call them. You just have to handle it yourself. <laughs> Drugs is a big part of gay escorting, right? Mm, yeah. They go hand in hand now. I mean, they used to didn't so much, but now they do. I mean... All of them do drugs. They get so high, they don't even have sex. They sit there, they're on this search. And I encourage the search. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, keep looking. Looking for what? Because uh, they, oh, they want to, oh, it would be hot if we get another guy to come over. You know, all that bullshit. And so they run the clock while they're looking for guys. Oh, yeah, like that whole hourly thing and everything like that, please. You don't make money that way, you know? No, tell me, what do you mean? I don't have an hourly rate. I get more money that way because then they feel like it's not like a rush session. You feel me? It's, it's a mind fuck. You just have to know how to caress them, I guess, and finesse them. Your price is reflected in more like, we'll hang out, we'll eventually have sex. When we're done with that, I'll be done. Uh-huh, yeah. But um, it doesn't even ever get to the sex normally. I mean, it do I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I never have to have sex. Well, but for the most part, no. Ed Buck was a wealthy political activist and Democratic donor who has donated more than $500,000 to political candidates such as Hillary Clinton. The first time I went over there, um, I had, was in school, so I had to take my school stuff with me. And when I got there, I just remember thinking to myself, this is really strange. Like, there's something different about this man. And the energy in his apartment was just really, like, off. Was it a huge apartment? Because he's really rich, right? That was the thing. It wasn't um, It wasn't big at all. It was like a little two-bedroom on Laurel. It looked like a common day tweaker's house. A bunch of unfinished projects and these ugly blue walls. Ugh. And a, a couch with a mattress on the floor. 
And I just thought that was really rude, you know what I mean? I was just like, God, you know? So, you know, of course, he wanted to get high. That was part of it. He made that very clear that he wanted to do drugs. You know, of course, I'd do it with everybody else, so let's go. And I remember during me being passed out, like, some of the things that he was doing, like, at one point he was choking me, another point he was, like, popping me in the face. At one moment he was, like, almost like he was caressing my face. You finally wake up from the daze, and yeah. what do you see? Well, he's walking to me with the needles, and I'm looking at him, like, uh, looking at, for the time, I'm like, uh, I gotta go to school. And he's like, well, the party's just starting. Two weeks later, I was in school, and he texted me about getting together that night, and I agreed, because I needed the money, and it wasn't the worst experience I had ever had. So I went over there again, like a dummy, and his behavior was very strange. When you're an escort, you, you learn to pay attention to everything, because the moment you don't is the moment you get, you know, you get f***ed up. I was paying attention to what he was doing, and he had two bags. Neither one of them was almost empty, and he went into both of the bags. That was a red flag to me. When he was giving me the injection, I something in my mind was like, don't let him put all that in you. And I slapped it out of my arm. And he got so irate and told me I was wasting his money, I was wasting his time, I was wasting his drugs, what, I was a pussy. But I started to feel heavy, and I just like sat on and I just went back down on the floor, and I, all of a sudden I couldn't move. I couldn't talk, nothing. But I could move my eyes. He would come up and like, Poke me like he's you, like if you ran over a dog, you know, and you see if the dog is still alive. <laughs> I remember him poking at me, and then he went in the closet and he had a chainsaw. A chainsaw? Yeah. He brought the chainsaw and he turned it on, and it was so loud. Oh my god! And he started walking towards me, and when he got to me, like I just I remember getting this strength, like I was able to pull myself up. <gasps> Well, off the floor. I went to the window and I was going to take myself and like put myself as far as I could out the window and <laughs> fall. <laughs> it was only for the second floor. So I was like, well, if I break an arm, I'll be fine. At least I'll be out of here. And he was coming at me with that chainsaw. But when he saw me out the window like that, you know, he was just like, he made a left and he went to the wall and started cutting a hole in the wall. So I stood there at that window for like an hour because the fresh air was helping me and I was really wobbly, but I didn't want him to know how wobbly I was. I was just like, listen, I was like, I've got to get back home. I was like, I have my dogs to take care of. And I told him that I have no friends or nobody that was going to go, you know, take care of them. I needed to go. I wasn't going to leave, <laughs> this is the hooker in me. Like, I'm not going to leave until I get my money. Like, period. At the end of the day, I'm not leaving until I get my fucking money. Because, like, now I know I'm not going to do no more of your shit. And But we're going to get my money, period. At the end, I'm not, I'm not leaving until, because we're going to have a problem. I, we can both go to jail. I don't give a fuck. Because I'm going to beat your ass in the back of that police car, and I'm going to get you beat up in jail. So, it's nothing. Mm. And um, this is the mentality I had now. Mm -hmm. So, I sat there with him and bullshitted. I, he's, like, go round and round, loop-de-loop-de-loo -loop -loop about this f***ing money. So, I told him to call me an Uber, and I was like, when, by the time I get my, to my apartment, you better f***ing sell me that money. And he didn't. For New Year's, I was in New York. I get a phone call. You know, I, sh I really shouldn't ever want to see you again, but I'm so intrigued. I was like, oh, really? I was like, well, this is what you're going to do. You're going to send me some money first. So he sent it to me, and I was like, F you. You know what I mean? I'm not going back over there. When I got back to town, I because I used to rob a lot of people, I would get the money and just run out the door, you know? Mm -hmm. But I was trying not to be like that because I got older, and I believe in karma, and I just, even if it was, pro whatever, you, you just don't want to fuck people over like that because not everybody's a bad person, and you don't want it to come back whenever you least need it to happen. I called him, and I was like, but, uh, you know, I know what I did. I know I need to make this right. Blah, 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 I'll come see you tonight. That night, it was January 6th, it was a Sunday. I really did not want to go back over there that night because I had school the next day. And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, let me call this guy and see, can I reschedule? And um, I called him and I was like, listen, I told him the deal and he was like, you know what? I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. So yeah, it might be better that we switch, switch the days. But I already had the, the things made. 30 minutes later, those shots that he made killed the next person. So let me make sure I get this right. So you were supposed to go over there and you didn't, and he had prepared drugs for you. You didn't go over there and the drugs that he prepared for you, he used to somebody else and it killed that person. Yeah. So it would have been you had you gone over there. If I had went over there that night, I would have let him inject me. You know what I mean? And I feel like maybe it was on some get back, like because of what I'd done. When I woke up in the morning, it was on the news. They said, Ed Hook's done it again, you know, and um, I'm looking, I'm like, fuck. And I look at the news, and there he was. Tonight, new information about the latest person to die inside Ed Buck's apartment. 
Dean is the second person to turn up dead inside Ed Buck's apartment in less than a year and a half. 26-year-old Jamel Moore overdosed on methamphetamine in July of 2017. A homicide investigation was held and Buck was never charged. Then you get asked to speak in court about your experiences. When this happened, keep in mind, the police did not do anything. He was telling them it was a drug overdose, that they did the drugs before he came, they came to the house and the police were listening to him. This is not a situation where Mr. Buck has caused the death. This is a situation where Mr. Buck has had longtime friends who unfortunately do not handle their life well. The first victim's mom was on the TV and she just, this woman would go to his house with a blow horn and stand in front of, you know, she refused to let her son's memory die. It like touched me in a way. Uh, she said it on TV, she was like, we know that this happened to other people and we need your help, you know, we need you to come forward. But unfortunately, because all the victims were black, and it's fucked up that it's like this, but... Ned Buck once had power and influence, but he turned into a depraved predator, targeting young, poor, black gay men, dosing them, even injecting them with meth to the point of death. I contacted the mother. I knew what I was putting myself, like, the kind of position I was putting myself in. I knew I was up to the can of worms, but I looked at it like this. If something happens, that's why we're working. They will not investigate it because we live a risky life. So I just felt like I had to go forward, you know what I mean, and tell what happened to me because I knew they would listen to me. Cody, who's listed as one of the additional victims in the federal charges. I showed them receipts, I showed them payments, I showed them messages, I showed them, I let them hear voicemails. I didn't have to do any of this. I could have been like most other people and like, oh, it's not my business, but it was my business because I didn't want anybody else to get hurt. You're a hero for that, you know that, right? You are. I just, I did the right thing. There's people like you that need to speak up because you're saving other people's lives. In a sense, yes, but not everybody's gonna look at it like that, you know? And um, and because of that, you know, I know people judge. I was willing to do whatever I had to do to help with the case and help the mother. We became very close. I admire her so much. On Christmas, they would put bags of coal on this man's porch. <laughs> You know, on his birthday, they, she would fly from Houston. She didn't have no money. And she would fly out here and to blow up that blow horn and they would have a celebrate. You know, and in a sense, I'm not saying I was jealous or whatever, but it was just, it was so touching, like, to see somebody care about their child that much. After all of these events that you've gone through, are you scared to continue doing this hustle? Or how do you look at it now? Not scared. I worry sometimes, but... It is what it is. I mean, you can get, you can be a, a postman or a worker, or you can anything you do, something bad can happen to you. You feel me? I mean, you can be walking down the street and a goddamn tiger comes off the back of a truck and hits you and kills you, and that's it. You know? So I just, I'm, I'm aware. I'm aware of what can happen. No one wanted to touch this. This has been a long time coming. We're very happy. No amount of time can bring my brother back but I feel some kind of solace and some kind of relief for my family that he will be in prison for a very long time. Buck's behavior sparked outrage, but his arrest didn't come until years after Moore's death, and only after federal investigators took over the case. The 67-year-old, who donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to Democratic politicians and causes, preyed on young, poor black men. I've had people trying to do documentaries and Da, 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 you know, all this type of stuff. And I saw that, what your aim is whenever you do these interviews with people. And it wasn't so much, I didn't feel like you were gonna exploit me. Does that make sense? 